Gracious Father, we rejoice in those words and, and the truth of it, that, that greater is you than in anything that is in this world. And because of that, we can worship you, Lord. Because of that, we can have hope as you take, take care of us. So guide us this morning, Father. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to Jesus' name. You guys can be seated. Welcome to everybody listening on, on the radio and on Facebook and stuff. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, this week, uh, men's discipleship uh, resumes at two o'clock, uh, six o'clock on Tuesday, and so I encourage you guys to come out for that. And then uh, Thursday, the women's discipleship uh, resumes as well at six thirty here at church. That's because my wife is healthy and she's back. Yay! <laughs> so I'm happy for that. And then um, uh, this coming Saturday, uh, July second, uh, we're going to have a work day here at church. Uh, basically, uh, we've got three acres in the back that we kind of. Uh, knock the grass down for, for uh, fire abatement and that kind of thing. And then uh, general yard work in the backyard, you know, pulling weeds and that kind of stuff. But it's going to be a fun time together if you guys want to come. There's a sign up on the, the counter, and we'll have lunch together at the end of it and uh, call it a day. Go from like 8.30 to about 1 o'clock, and then we'll be done. And then uh, the following Monday, and that's kind of what we're getting ready for, uh, Monday the 4th, uh, we're going to have a church barbecue, and so a potluck barbecue at 5 o'clock. In fact, I don't think the time made it in the bulletin, but uh, 5 o'clock here. And uh, the church will provide burgers and hot dogs and chicken. You guys bring the side dishes, and we'll come uh, blow up some fireworks and talk politics and uh, have a good time. And so it'll be a good time together. There's a sign-up on the counter for that. And then uh, the, the Reno Aces baseball game is coming up pretty quick on the 19th, August 19th. And uh, we probably need to get our money in, in the next week or two, so uh, start thinking about that a little bit. But, uh, again, there's a sign-up on the counter for that. And then uh, looking ahead a little bit, September 10th, uh, there's a women's uh, one-day conference at Little Country Church in Reading. Uh, the cost on that is $25, and it's, every year it's been a good conference, been very uh, edifying and beneficial to the ladies, and so I encourage the ladies to, the registration begins July 15th, it's online. Uh, our sign-up on the counter is basically uh, for carpooling and that kind of stuff, and so uh, we'll get you squared away there. And I just want to make mention of the Supreme Court decision this last week, overturning Roe versus Wade. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, praise the Lord for that. You know, and you know what? We do praise the Lord, and we thank him for, uh, you know, working that way uh, in our country. I mean, so much of the news that we get is about unrighteousness, and, and now to have something that goes in the way of righteousness. Now, abortion has not been outlawed. I mean, uh, and this, this battle is not over. Uh, we keep praying, you know, and we're not spiking the football, you know, and glad our enemies have been defeated kind of thing. We're glad that uh, God's been honored, you know, in the sanctity of life and, and those kinds of things. And so we praise the Lord for that. Father God, we do thank you and praise you for this decision. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here today, Lord, to worship you and to sing your praises and to dig into your word. And so guide us in all those things, Father, and be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
coming on the lawn. He is trampling on the bitches where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has looked the painful sight of his terrible Swiss sword. Father God, thank you. Thank you for songs like that that remind us of who you are, what you're doing, and what your plan is. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to worship you this morning. And we pray truly, Lord, that you'd be lifted up on high and glorified in every way. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, why don't you turn and say hello to each other real quick. Bless the kids and let them scream out of here. That's right. Hey, buddy, how you doing? I'm going to get five stars. Are you? Oh, you got your Bible, huh? We always do. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. We want, we want God to bless you guys. Hey, River. Come on up, bud. Okay. All right, guys, it's time to pray for the kiddos. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these precious kids. And we ask, Lord, that you would minister to them today, that you would bless them, that you would speak to their hearts, that you would draw them to yourself, Lord, and that truly you'd be glorified. Bless your kids, Father. Bless those that are ministering to them. Help them, Father, to hear your voice and to be yielded to you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good job. One of them dropped their memory verse. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen to that. Well, I'm excited to get into our study this morning. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 6. We're uh, continuing our study. We started it last week. Uh, dropped off or left off in verse 5, but we're going to uh, pick up at verse 6 today. But we'll read the chapter together, then we'll go back and we'll study it through. And so, if you will, 
Open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. Then after you get your Bibles open there, if you're able, uh, would you stand with me in reverence uh, for God's word as we read it together? Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature saying, Come. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And so I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And so I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Gracious Father, we read these fearsome words, and, and we tremble at your word. We know that these things are going to come to pass, Lord, but we're grateful that, that we're not going to be here for it. We ask you, Lord, to give us understanding in these things, Help us, Lord, to see the significance of it, to know how to apply it even our own lives. Guide us, Lord, as you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. Well, last week, as we began this chapter, uh, the first seal uh, called forth the rider of the white horse. And we identified that rider as the Antichrist. Uh, and he came, uh, you know, deceptively, if you will. Uh, in verse 3, we have uh, the second seal being opened, uh, the red horse uh, coming forth, taking peace from the earth, and, and that people should kill one another. And so we see a tremendous amount of uh, violence. Then in verse 5, uh, we left off with the third seal, uh, the black horse coming forth. And that black horse, the rider is not identified, but he's holding uh, a pair of scales in his hand. And scales are uh, indicative of both uh, commerce and judgment. And so we get to verse 6, and the, the second part, if you will, dealing with that third seal, the, the, the famine. Verse 6, it says, uh, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not harm the oil and the wine. And so uh, a quart of wheat uh, for a denarius, three quarts of barley for the same. The Greek historian uh, Herodotus uh, tells us that uh, back in the, the, that day when this was written, uh, a Roman soldier's daily wage was what was called a koinix, K-O-I-N-I-X. And basically that's about a half a quart of corn. And so essentially two coffee cups of corn was a soldier's daily wage. Uh, that's what they lived on. And the, we're being told now uh, that uh, a day's wage, a denarius, and uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 2, tells us that a denarius, a penny essentially, is a day's wage. But thus a working man uh, will not be able to support his family 
in that day. If a day's wage buys enough food, barely enough food for one man, what's that going to do for a man and his wife, for a man and his wife and his children? And so essentially, uh, a man's not going to be able to support his family or they'll be on uh, a starvation-type diet. And so it's going to get, you know, pretty bad. Uh, wheat and uh, barley are necessities, uh, whereas uh, oil and wine are considered luxuries. Um, I don't know if it's always been the case, but oftentimes, you know, I, I remember going to Safeway and uh, looking at bottled water and then looking at soda and discovering that soda pop, uh, which is not the best thing for you, is actually cheaper than water. And water is pretty expensive. I mean, the guy that invented bottled water has got to be a gazillionaire by now. Uh, but he's taking something uh, that's good and making it expensive and taking stuff that's bad for you and making it cheap. What do you think people are going to drink? And same, same concept here. Uh, luxury items for the rich will still abound, such as oils and liquors. Um, and the rider on the, on the black horse brings basically four things. The first is uh, economic balances are greatly altered, rearranged. Uh, there's mass inflation. Uh, food prices uh, rise dramatically, and the quality of the food is reduced. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, barley is, the an is food for animals, and when people can't get enough corn uh, to feed their family, they're going to buy barley because they can get more of it for uh, you know, the same amount of money, and so that's what people are going to turn to. Uh, luxury items like liquor will not be affected, uh, very much like Western culture today. I think those, there's going to be a spiritual parallel at work at the same time. Uh, there's going to be a famine for that which nourishes the spirit. Uh, there's going to be a famine for the word of God. You know, the church is gone. Uh, they've been raptured away. New believers are actively and rigorously being persecuted and martyred. Uh, Bibles are going to be pretty hard to find. And so um, it, it's going to be a tough time for the believers. Uh, we read in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, uh, there's two parts to this. Verse 11 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, uh, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And, you know, I've, and I've spoken this many times in, in general, uh, that today there is a famine for the hearing of the word of the Lord. You, know, you can go to Walmart and buy Bibles. You can go to uh, uh, Safeway's got Bibles. I mean, Bibles abound. The problem is not having Bibles as it says here, there's a, there's a famine for the hearing of God's word. And I would say the doing of God's word along with that. But it transitions here in verse 12, Amos 8, verse 12. It says, and they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And so it's going to be a hard time, you know, for these new believers. Uh, the Holy Spirit will be present uh, and no doubt uh, busy at this time. He won't be restraining evil the way that he has. But, you know, when the church is raptured out of here, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believers has gone with it. But the Holy Spirit's still going to be here on earth. And I believe there's going to be a greater revival during the tribulation time period than at any other time in human history. More people are going to get saved because so many people have not heard the gospel. So many people have not had the opportunity to hear the gospel and, and, and possibly to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And these terrible, terrible times that are going to come upon the earth are very much going to drive that. Now we get to verses uh, 7 and 8, and, and this is describing the fourth seal, uh, the pale horse, uh, ridden by death and, and followed by Hades, uh, or actually ridden by Hades and followed by death. Um, but in verses 7 and 8, it says, uh, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And so I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed uh, with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And so the first thing you kind of see here is the connection between death and Hades. And it's kind of like the, the, the Siamese twins of Revelation. You know, in the New Testament, you hear that phrase, grace and peace, uh, often connected together in Paul's letters. And the same thing with Peter. Uh, and, and you don't see them apart from each other, typically. Uh, same thing here. When it comes to death and Hades, uh, when Jesus was describing himself in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he said, I have the keys to Hades and death. Again, the connection. Uh, uh, towards the end of the book in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 13 and 14, 
it says that death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. Then in verse 14, uh, then death and Hades were cast into uh, the lake of fire. Uh, again, you know, that connection. As uh, we read verse 7, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the living creature saying, come. And so Jesus opens that fourth seal. Uh, the fourth living creature commands, come, and then the pale horse and rider respond. In verse 8, uh, so I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And so the fourth seal releases the pale horse, whose rider is identified as Death. Now, this is the only one of the four horses, or horsemen, that is actually identified, identified as Death. We, we figured out that the, the rider of the white horse was the Antichrist, because uh, Jesus kind of laid that out for us. Uh, the rider of the red horse is not identified, uh, other than he's got a big sword. Uh, the rider of the black horse is not identified, other than he's got scales. So we don't know who they are, if there's names to them or not. Uh, but here we see that death is followed closely by Hades. Now, the fourth horse, it says the pale horse, uh, but the Greek word for pale is the word chloros, uh, in the Greek language, which means green. And so it's uh, green like grass. You know, there's different shades of green there. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's not pale in a sense of like light gray or something like that. It's a, kind of a greenish-looking uh, horse. Uh, but 25% of the world's population will be killed during this time. Uh, that's an astronomical number of people. Uh, they are given power to kill, it says here, by the sword, meaning violence, uh, war, uh, by famine or hunger, um, which, you know, we recognize what that is. It says with death. Uh, the word for death is also translated as pestilence or disease, and I think we're fairly familiar with that lately. Uh, and then it says with the beasts of the earth. I understand the first three. I mean, we've seen those in, in everyday life, uh, but we're not accustomed uh, to the animals turning on humankind, if you will. Uh, I mean, back in the cowboy days, I had to worry about wolves, that kind of stuff. But now uh, the beast could be, it could be uh, uh, biological weapons like the, the small, in, you know, small microscopic beasts. Uh, Chuck Wizard kind of presses that a little bit. Or it could be lions and tigers and bears, you know, oh my. Uh, it could be, you know, wolves or wild dogs or jackals, who knows what. Uh, but it's interesting to see the tables turned where so many uh, people are being killed and, and, and by these unusual ways. Uh, but the thing is, We've gone past the point of no return. Uh, there's no stopping this. You know, you read through the prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah. You know, if you repent, I'll, you know, I'll withhold this. If you repent, uh, you'll stay in the land, those kinds of things. There's just that, 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 that description of God's grace, God's mercy. But in this instance, it's irreversible. It's going to happen. Uh, we read in Jeremiah chapter 4, uh, verse 28. Uh, Jeremiah the prophet tells us, for this uh, shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. And so it's pretty much a done deal. Uh, again, death and hell are tied together, and, and they are connected in other ways as well. When you think about it, death takes the body, but hell takes the soul. Okay? You know, our, our bodies are killed, you know, death, the grim reaper, all that kind of stuff. But, we're, but hell receives the soul of those that don't believe in Jesus Christ. And so uh, a, a dark connection, if you will. There are actually uh, three types or three levels of death uh, described in the Bible. Uh, there's physical death, referring to the body, uh, as a result of Adam's sin. Physical death, when your body just gives out, whether it's uh, perforated with bullets or run over by a steamroller, or just dies of old age, you know, stops to function, st is in, in it, incapable of expressing who the real person contained inside is. When it gives up, that's called physical death. And we see that all the time. You know, the Bible tells us it's appointed unto man once to die, uh, then the judgment. But the second kind of death is spiritual death. And that's where uh, the, the, the separation between that person and God through sin and rebellion against God. It's spiritual death is something that we inherited from Adam. Uh, again, spiritual death is separation from God. You can be alive physically, but dead spiritually. 
and that's what's being described here. Uh, but basically, it's reversible if we choose. It's our choice. I mean, we're born spiritually dead, but at some point we, we hear the gospel, we, we understand the truth of Jesus Christ, we begin to see who we are, that we're sinners, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit begins to come alongside and convict us of that sin, and we have a choice. We either receive Jesus or we, we deny him, uh, and if we receive him, we become spiritually alive, moving from death to life, uh, but if we reject him, then we remain in that state of spiritually dead. But then there's the third kind of death, which is the worst, and that is eternal death. Uh, that is eternal separation from God, the result of our not choosing to obey God. Uh, in a sense, spiritual, spiritual death is confirmed uh, in our hearts. And we are, you know, if we leave this life, uh, experience physical death without experiencing spiritual life, then we enter into eternity spiritually dead and remain that way, eternally separated from God. That's called being, quote unquote, damned. Uh, to everlasting hell. And so during the tribulation, uh, death will be completely turned loose to do as it wills upon the earth, so much so that God says that he's going to shorten that time. Otherwise, uh, everybody would be killed. There would be nobody left if you, if you just let it go. Uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 22, he says, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. For, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And so aren't you glad it's only the seven years of tribulation, not the 25 years of tribulation or whatever, uh, because God's going to make sure that people do survive and come out of that. Now, at the great white throne judgment, um, the death will be judged and destroyed. It describes that in Revelation 20, verse 14. But right now, death is pretty much running rampant. Uh, Paul makes a statement. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, he says, the last enemy that should be destroyed is death. And so towards the end of all things, you know, death itself will be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, death will have power over 25% of what the previous horsemen left behind. And as, and as Matthew 24, 22 suggests, uh, there will be a remnant uh, just as it's been prophesied um, in Ezekiel. Uh, chapter 14, verse 21. Uh, For thus says the Lord God, uh, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, uh, the sword and famine and the wild beasts and pestilence to cut off man and beast from it. Uh, yet behold, there shall be left in it a remnant who will be brought out. And so, you know, during the tribulation time period, again, uh, half the world's population uh, and I think a little more, but half the world's population at the least is going to be destroyed. Unimaginable uh, to think what that's going to be like. Uh, Jesus affirms the same, describing the four horsemen of the tribulation in the Olivet Discourse. In fact, if you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to the left uh, to Matthew chapter 24. We've read through this uh, passage a number of times. I've referenced it a lot recently. Uh, referring to the Olivet Discourse. This is Jesus' answer, his response to the question that his disciples asked him, when will these things be? And what's it going to be like, you know, when you come back? And the, the response that he gives, because it was given on the Mount of Olives, is referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And part of that here, I'm going to pick it up at verse 12. It says, Matthew 24, verse 4. I'm sorry, pick it up at verse 4. Uh, Take heed that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. That is the rider on the white horse. Um, verse 6, and you, should, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, that's the rider on the red horse. Um, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, that's the black horse, and pestilence, uh, that's the pale horse, and earthquakes uh, in various places, uh, and that's really the, that's the sixth seal there in verse 12, uh, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. And so in the Olivet Discourse, if you recognize it, there's the clues about what's going to take place as the six seals are broken here in Revelation chapter 6. Now the impact uh, of what happens because of uh, this fourth seal, this uh, pale rider, if you will, is a quarter of the year's population is going to be killed. Now, 
we just passed this threshold uh, a month ago or so, uh, where now the, the planet Earth has, they estimate, 8 billion people. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, honestly, about a year and a half ago, we are about, it's 7.9 billion or something like that. And so today the, the population of the planet Earth is 8 billion people. 25%, a quarter of that group will be killed uh, during the first six seals of Revelation. Later on, another third will be killed, which will be, you know, another third of what you see up on the, on the graphic there. And that means half the world's population is going to perish in the end of all this. I've had people tell me at times before, hey, we're in the end times now. Uh, I, I think we are in the end times in the sense of we're, we're leading up to the, the rapture and the second coming of our Lord. But this is not the Great Tribulation. Uh, the, the preterist view of the millennium, other, other views uh, that claim that, you know, we're in, the, we're in the tribulation time period right now. And I said, no, when was the last time in history where you saw, you know, ha you know a, a quarter or half the world's population killed at one time? That's never happened. When was the last time you've seen all the rivers and the, and the oceans and the ponds and the lakes turn to blood? That's never happened before. And so we're not in the last days in that sense. We are in the last days leading up to, I, I believe, the rapture and those kinds of things. The signs are all around us, but they're all precursors to the things that are going to happen after the rapture during the Great Tribulation time period. And so a quarter of the world's population is, is uh, taken away. Uh, that's two billion people. Uh, I can't even imagine uh, what that would be like. Uh, but the source of the method uh, of death is the sword and famine and pestilence and wild animals. And so uh, going to be a terrible, terrible time. Uh, in verse 9, uh, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for their testimony, uh, which they held. And so Jesus opens the fifth seal. Uh, John then sees under the altar the souls of those who are slain. And, and take note of this. They're slain for the word of God and for their testimony. I mean, I don't know if there's a good way or a bad way to die, but you know what? To be slain for the word of God and their testimony is an honorable death. Uh, it's a worthy or worthwhile death. You know, you get killed because you're trying to beat the train across the tracks. That's just stupid, okay? Uh, you get killed robbing a bank, tough luck. That's just what you got coming, you know. But to die a martyr's death because you're claiming Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're dying for the word of God and the testimony, I take that any day of the week. You know, that's, a, that's a good way, an honorable way to go, if you will. John sees these, uh, these, these referred to basically as tribulation saints or tribulation martyrs uh, that die for their faith under the altar. And this is a group of people that are described in different places in Revelation. Uh, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, in the next chapter, uh, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's why they're called tribulation saints. Uh, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, uh, and I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment uh, was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded uh, for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God uh, who did not worship the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This gives us a couple clues about the, the tribulation martyrs. Number one, uh, during the tribulation time period, like I said, there's going to be a great revival. A lot of people are going to get saved, but it's going to cost them. And their martyrdom is going to come around, or come about by being, quote, unquote, beheaded. That's what this reference kind of points out. But they're also the ones who have rejected the mark of the beast. And uh, the mark of the beast is one of those things that people ask about from time to time. Uh, you know, is the, is the shot the mark of the beast? Or is the uh, uh, radio IDF, whatever it is, EMF tag uh, that people get in Europe? You know, now they, they put a little thing in you about as big as a grain of rice, and you can, you can open your doors to your house, you can, your medical records, your financial stuff's on. You can wave your hand over the, the scanner at the market, you know, and, and pay for your stuff. Oh, it's the mark of the beast. No, that's a precursor, I believe, to the mark of the beast. But it's not the mark of the beast because the mark of the beast is... A, 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 an outward expression of faith and commitment to the beast, the Antichrist. Uh, it, it's an act of worship. 
And so it's not like you get drunk, like people get drunk and get a tattoo. Uh, you're not going to get drunk and wake up, and, oh, I got the mark of the beast. Oh, no. Uh, not like that. You know, it, it's not something people are going to force on you, other than threatening you. If you don't get it, you're going to die. You know, I mean, the threat of death is certainly going to be there. Uh, but it's not, you know, a, a coincidental kind of a thing. Uh, it is a definite, overt act of worship. And so uh, the Bible describes that those that get that will be eternally damned. Getting the mark of the beast, an act of worship, uh, is that final straw. And, you know, basically they're, they're no longer eligible to go to heaven. But these tribulation saints are the ones that have avoided that. And they are under the altar. You're going to see them in different places as, as they're described in the book of Revelation. Here initially, they're described as being under the altar, in a sense, under the blood of the Lamb. Uh, there'll be another time where they're in front of the altar uh, in a different, slightly different position. The believers that get raptured to, into heaven with Jesus are seated on the throne with him. So everybody's in heaven. It's just like different seats at the table. You're in this seat, they're in that seat, that kind of a thing. And so you'll see different positions or locations of some of uh, the people that are described here. Uh, one of the questions that comes up from time to time is, uh, what about the, the end time churches? You remember as we went through the seven letters to the seven churches, the last four churches were considered the churches of the church age. And only one of those churches, the church in Philadelphia, is raptured away. That leaves the, the last three churches that are, in a sense, left behind to go through the tribulation. Okay? And so we're talking about Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea. And, uh, and, and we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, and, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, uh, for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that, that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, when you think about it, the believers are caught up in the rapture to be with the Lord in, in heaven, right? The non-believers, and, and God is the one who determines who really believes and who doesn't, he knows. Because there are lots of people out there that say, you know, they love the Lord, but they live like the devil. You know, they love the Lord, and maybe they're self-deceived or whatever, but this is the group that I believe at one point will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do these awesome things? And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You know, depart from me. And so there's going to be a, a, a fairly large group like that, but the bottom line is believers are caught up to be with the Lord. They're with him. The non-believers are left behind, no matter what you call yourself. And so, you know, the, these, these churches... Uh, are represented, uh, represent a lot of people that claim to be believers, but really in a certain sense aren't. And so now they're subject to the strong delusion. There's no middle ground with Jesus. Either we love him by accepting him on his terms, or he says we hate him. You're with me or you're against me. There is no middle ground. There is no place on the fence, if you will. And uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other, but you cannot serve both God and mammon. And so we have to make those choices. And these churches, these, the, the, these Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea, representing many of the modern-day churches today, having compromised so much in the church age, aren't going to fare any better during the tribulation time period. I mean, now we've got the benefit of the Holy Spirit to help us, but when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn that way, uh, they're not going to do any better uh, without the Holy Spirit. Now, in verse 10, uh, it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The tribulation martyrs cry out, how long till you avenge us? And the tribulation martyrs, are, again, are those that refuse the mark of the beast. They refuse to worship uh, the Antichrist. And looking ahead to Revelation chapter 14, uh, there's an angel that goes about all the earth warning those not to take the mark of the beast. So the other part of this is, is we talk about the mark of the beast in general. It's not something that we're going to have to worry about now. 
it's something that people during the tribulation will have to worry about, make that choice. But we don't have to worry about that because we're going to get raptured away. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, it says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. This means that if anybody receives the mark of the beast in actuality, uh, they are forever damned to hell, and there's no fixing it. And so it's a, it's a one-time bad choice. Um, and again, it, it'll be very obvious. It, it's not going to be, oops, I got one. Uh, it's an act of the will and not something that will happen uh, accidentally. Now, uh, there are some people that think that the, the rapture, the tribulation, uh, are going to kind of be an escape hatch of sorts. Um, people that think, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to live my life the way I want to right now. And when I see the rapture happen, when the, when the tribulation starts, then I'll get right with God, you know, and get ready to, you know, like that. And uh, I've had people tell me that, people that I love. And I try to explain the foolishness of that uh, because their appeal is based on um, a misunderstanding of Scripture and even by some popular Christian movies. Uh, many of you, I, I saw, I enjoyed the, the, the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye made into movies and stuff. But the premise of that movie is based on faulty theology. The premise of that movie is uh, the airline pilot guy, you know, uh, his wife's a Christian. She loves the Lord. She's pestering him all the time to get saved. He won't do it. The rapture happens. Oh, no, it's real. So he gets saved. And then other people get saved like that. But the Bible doesn't describe that. The Bible describes that if you've heard the gospel and rejected it, when the rapture happens and you're left behind, you've heard the gospel, rejected it, now you're going to be subject to the great delusion that God's going to pour out on those who've heard the gospel and rejected it. And the scripture that I base this on is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10, 11, and 12. And it says here, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so this group of people that have rejected the gospel and left behind, you know, they're going to receive the delusion. They'll think it's aliens or who knows what they're going to think but they're going to fall into that lie. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But that's now. And I, and I believe even during the tribulation time period, there's going to be some that receive that delusion and they're just, they're done. Their fate is sealed in a certain sense. But there's a whole bigger group of people who have actually never heard the gospel, who have never had an opportunity to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And I'm blown away. Even today, you walk around. I mean, years ago, I'd go witnessing and talk to people. And I was a lot of people already heard the gospel. And some received them, some rejected them, but they heard the gospel. Now I talk to young people. that They've heard the name of Jesus, but they don't really even know who that is. They've never heard the, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of their salvation. People legitimately have not heard it. And there'll be a lot more of those people that do eventually hear it during that time period and, and get saved. And during the tribulation time period, there'll be a great revival, but it's going to cost them. And it, their, their, their newfound faith will be tested. And the Bible describes that they will be martyred or beheaded for their faith. Sounds kind of weird, but the, the church is being persecuted today, not so much in our country, but in other parts of the world, persecution is rampant. And, you know, the, they know who the real believers are. 
because they're the ones that are being persecuted and killed and tortured and all kinds of things are happening and they're still proclaiming Jesus as their Lord and Savior in spite of the bad things that are happening. And that's real faith. That's faith that's tested. But now these tribulation saints, these tribulation martyrs are under the altar and their cry is, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge us? And their, 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 their request is based on history. You know, the first murder in the Bible, when Cain slew Abel, God told Cain that Abel's blood cried out to him. And, you know, and, 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 and then later on, Jesus makes a similar remark that the righteous blood of the, of the prophets cries out. And so the, God knows. God keeps score, if you will. And they know that he's going to make things right. Their appeal is based on God's righteous character. They know that the evil deeds will be repaid, if you will. They're not asking if you will. They're just asking how long it's going to be. They're, they're impatient. Anybody here impatient with the Lord uh, as I am a little bit? Like, let's get the rapture going, you know. <laughs> Any, right now is good. Uh, I don't feel like i got to finish the service. <laughs> it's like, okay, Lord, practical lesson, whoosh, you know, and we're all gone. But they're asking how long until this happens, how much longer. And what they're doing is like we're doing. They're waiting on the Lord. You know, what Paul tells us in Romans 12, 19, he says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves or do not avenge ourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so God's going to take care of it. Uh, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, almost the last verse in the Bible, it says, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone, to give every man according to his work. Now, this is a relative kind of a thing to give every man according to his work. You know, Jesus was asked by a, a, a Pharisee one point, actually a scribe, what must we do to do the works of God? And Jesus explained that the work singular of God is to believe in the one he sent. And so he's, gonna, he's coming back to give us our reward for the work that we've done, which is to believe in Jesus. That would be a good reward. But to those who rejected him and, and committed all the evil things they've been doing, He's coming back to give them the reward for their works as well, which is radically different, uh, which is actually eternal damnation. It's hell. And so he's coming quickly to do that. Uh, in verse 11, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. So the first thing is that white robes are given to the martyrs. The, the, that's the reward of, of overcomers. We see that throughout the Bible, actually. Uh, in Isaiah 61, verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the faithful remnant in Sardis, overall Sardis was kind of rebuked. But he says, you have a few names that haven't given into these things. And it says to that smaller group within that church, in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, he says, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And so they're going to get, you know, again, the similarity there. Now, the tribulation martyrs are told to wait a little while longer until their number is complete. What this means is that in, in God's mind and heart, he knows the last person that's going to get saved. He knows the last, so the number's complete. There's a number. I don't know what that number is. None of us do. But it's, you know, it's just ticking away. And at some point when it ticks down to zero or, you know, eight billion, three million, whatever, I don't know which way he's going. But when that number is complete, that's when God will move forward to that part, you know, of the process. So God is keeping track. There is a predetermined number. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 27, verse 14, he says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall, he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know, in the spirit, we can do that. In the flesh, it's pretty tough, isn't it? <laughs> Waiting on the Lord. You know, I kind of want to get this, this show on the road. John the Baptist, you know, are you the one we're looking for? We're, we're looking for somebody else. Uh, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know, let's go. And, uh, and so it's not uncommon uh, for us as Christians. Now, 
uh, four basic points that get out of uh, verse 11. The first one is that the dead are conscious and aware of the promise. The, these tribulation saints are under the altar. They're in heaven, but they're fully aware of what's going on. How long, O oh Lord, till you, you know, finish up the program here? Just like uh, the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was very aware of his circumstances, what was going on around him. He was thirsty and hot and miserable. And so the dead are conscious and aware of the promises of God. Secondly, these believers are resting for the moment, meaning uh, their lives will be characterized later on uh, by a greater degree of activity. Uh, this is the tribulation time period. It's a seven-year period, but after that's the millennium. Uh, in the millennium, according to Revelation chapter 20, uh, the, we as believers, the tribulation saints who are also in heaven, are going to be uh, engaged, used by the Lord to rule and to reign with him. Apparently, that'll be more active than just hanging out by the altar. And so, you know, relatively anyway. Uh, the third point is that God's plan is right on schedule. Uh, he's paying attention. His timetable is in operation. And then fourthly, uh, many, many, many believers will be killed during the tribulation time period. And the number is not yet full. You know, we know that uh, a great many are going to perish, you know, two billion to start with, another two billion after that. And, uh, you know, but there will be many believers that, among that group uh, that end up in heaven, which would be a glorious thing. In verse 12, we come to the sixth seal. It says, I looked, and be, and I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and, and the moon became like blood. Verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and it, it kind of goes on. So here we see Jesus opening the sixth seal. Uh, this is literally the halfway point in the seven-year tribulation. Uh, this is the halfway point in what's referred to as the 70th week of Daniel. And so uh, in the Olivet Discourse, uh, our Lord Jesus described uh, a time of deception and the appearance of many antichrists. He spoke of wars and rumors of wars and famine and death and persecution and pestilence and all those things, uh, the signs that would occur uh, on the earth, all of which are found to exist in the six sealed judgments that we're reading about. But Jesus described one event in particular that was kind of distinguishable um, that is described in the prophecy of Daniel. It's something we, it's a word, it's a phrase that we're familiar with, the abomination of desolation. And that actually comes to us uh, from Daniel's prophecy, but it marks the three and a half year mark. It's the midway point in the great tribulation time period. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, uh, Daniel prophesies, he says, Then he, speaking of the Antichrist, uh, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, a week of years, seven years. Uh, but in the middle of the week, that's three and a half years, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so Jesus, Daniel tells us that, you know, three and a half years into it, here's what's going to happen. Now, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, he says, Then when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and just to paraphrase, get out of town, you know, run you know, find a place essentially to hide because it's happening. But this particular event takes place in the middle of the week, in the middle of what we call the Great Tribulation time period. The tribulation will continue to increase in intensity, uh, much like the birth pangs of a woman, uh, to where Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 21, then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. This is the, as bad as it's ever going to get. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. In fact, so it follows that, uh, that the events that Jesus describes before the midpoint uh, of this final seven-year period, specifically Matthew uh, 24, verses 4 through 14, describe the same events as the first six seals. And we went through the Olivet Discourse and I laid out you know, where the horsemen all kind of fall in with what's described there. Uh, but it describes the same events as the first six seals as they're opened. 
uh, and this is what Jesus described as a quote, the beginning of birth pangs, or as it puts it in Matthew 24, verse 8, these are the beginning of sorrows. Um, so this sixth seal marks the halfway point in the tribulation time period and begins with tremendous upheavals. Uh, I, I'm kind of a news junkie. I follow uh, current events, and I watch uh, one particular um, news source called The Two Preachers. And what these guys do, what these guys do, a couple pastors, that they just, uh, people from all over the world email them their phone videos of an earthquake happening right now in Iran, a flood happening in China, or all these different things. And every single week, there's all these things uh, that show all the, the natural catastrophes that are happening. And it's, and it's kind of sad to watch, but they don't compare to what's going to happen during the tribulation time period. It's going to be uh, terrible. And, and, and these are all things, by the way, that were described and prophesied of long, long before it would ever come to pass. Uh, one example, uh, in Joel uh, chapter 2, verses 30 and 31, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. You know, the uh, uh, pillars uh, of smoke. Last summer, the fires. I mean, after like, I don't know what, eight, eight years of summer, <laughs> you know, and all the smoke, you, you start to wonder, is it ever going to clear up? You know? And it's like, and that was like what? Not even less than 1% of the trees. Imagine when a third of all the trees burn up at one time. Terrible. It, it's going to be terrible. Um, in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great uh, and awesome day of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 13, I won't read it out because it's a long passage, but in Isaiah 13, 6 through 16, it, it described all the same things, uh, the, the, the moon turning to blood and the smoke and the sun being blackened and all that stuff. But it adds to the description, and men will be more precious than gold. Why? Because they're going to be rare. Like precious jewels. Why are they precious? Because there's not a lot of them, you know, comparatively. And so men are going to be more precious than gold. Um, this great earthquake that's described here, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and all that stuff. But this is an earthquake of epic proportions. You know, I, I, I've grown up in Southern California most of my life and been up here. Uh, earthquakes are no big deal. I mean, we joked about them. We, you know, the houses start shaking and we get up and start singing surfing in the USA. And, uh, you know, um, it wasn't a big deal. We've, and we've seen 7.0. We've seen 9.0 in Japan and the tsunami that came after that and all the stuff, right? But imagine a 15 or a 20. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be the bigger and worse than ever seen in, in history. And, uh, and all the stuff that comes with it, it will be earthquakes, an earthquake of epic proportions. Uh, I don't use too many references out of Haggai, but here's one for you. Uh, Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once... It is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of nations, uh, all nations shall come. That's Jesus. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Later on uh, in our text, it's going to talk about islands being moved. You know, when Japan got moved like an inch a couple years ago during one of those big earthquakes, an inch, and the tsunami that came after that, wow. So... You know, hang on. Verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth and as a fig tree drops its late figs uh, when it's shaken by a mighty wind. The stars of heaven falling is the subject of lots of discussion and, and some debate. Uh, I, I can't tell you conclusively uh, what, I, what I believe it to be. I, I know what I believe it to be, but I, I, there's lots of people who kind of argue with that or debate it. Um, the stars of heaven fall to the earth uh, like ripened fruit in a strong wind. Uh, this could be literal, like the sky is falling, you know, and all part of the cataclysmic upheavals that are going to take place. Or it could be figurative in a sense, uh, speaking of the angels, the stars falling to the earth, 
um, the devil and his angels, if you will. Um, if you look at them as stars falling, like literally stars falling, uh, I would say yes, but not all of them, because later on, uh, in, in the next chapter and a couple chapters after that, you have a star falling for this and a star falling for that, so not all the stars obviously fall at one time. In uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 10, then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven. So you got a star falling, uh, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Ultimately, it, it turns the waters into blood. Uh, but that star fell and made that happen. Uh, in Revelation chapter 9, uh, verse 1, uh, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And so personal pronoun him is used, so that's obviously referring to an angel of some sort uh, falling and, and being given this key. Um, Jesus talked about having seen Satan essentially being cast out of heaven. <clears throat> and I think that that's, my opinion, is what this is kind of referencing. Um, in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, it says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To, uh, oh, I'm reading that. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Sorry, wrong, wrong verse there. And, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You know, um, they have these rides at amusement parks where you can go up on a, they, they bolt you into, the seatbelt you into this chair, they haul you up, click, 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 and you go up this big tall tower 300 feet in the air, and they don't just drop you, that would be enough, but they shoot you down with hydraulic pressure. And, and so about the time you're, you know, 100 feet down, your brains are still 100 feet above you, or your stomach is anyway, and, uh, and so you're shot down. Way different than a free fall. For a guy my age, a free fall would be just fine. You know, but they want to shoot you down. And here when Satan is cast out and sees him fall like lightning, that's not just, oh, see ya, and fall over the edge. No, that's like being cast out. Okay, that's God casting him out. Uh, but we read in, uh, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, speaking of uh, the red dragon, uh, Satan, uh, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them uh, to the earth. Uh, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels cast out with him. So again, this is not a passive, you know, kind of falling away kind of thing. It's something you're, you're thrown, you're chucked, you're shot, whatever. Um, when Jesus tells us in Luke 10, 18, like he did, uh, that he personally saw Satan fall from heaven, in my mind, that kind of implies that Jesus was in heaven to see that event take place. And so um, the timing of all this, I guess, is the biggest question. There's a really interesting verse uh, in John chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus is speaking of and predicting his own death, his crucifixion. And he says in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And, you know, as he says, now is the judgment of this world. Jesus is talking about how all of our sins, the sins of this world, are about to be judged, if you will, on the cross. I get that. The next part, he says, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now, the ruler of this world, obviously, is Satan. And cast out, my question is, from where? From, not from earth, because he's still pretty busy and active here on earth, isn't he? But he's actually cast out from heaven because he doesn't need to be there any longer because our sins are paid for. There's no need to hear the charges anymore. You remember during, uh, in, in the book of Job, uh, the, the sons of men are referenced to angels. At one point, Satan approaches God, and God says, Hey, if you consider my servant Job, he's a righteous dude, and all that kind of stuff. And, and the devil says, well, you, only because you protect him. And they go through the whole thing, and he's back and forth accusing Job and all that kind of stuff, and just like he was back and forth accusing us. But once Jesus paid the price on the cross, and the charges have been adjudicated, paid for, just like in John chapter 19, verse 30, to tell us that it is finished, it is paid in full, what's the sense in hearing the charges anymore? They've been paid in full. It'd be like, you know, you go to court here in the courthouse, 
and uh, you've got some, you know, case against you or whatever, and the judge slams the gavel down and says, you know, case adjudicated, does he let the attorney keep arguing? <laughs> no, because it's been dealt with. Same thing here. He was cast out because I don't need to hear you anymore. The charges have been paid for. Um, in Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And so I think this is a reference to just that. Now, verse 14. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Now, Again, this is all as a result of that earthquake that first mentioned there in verse 12. This is total upheaval. I don't know what to say about this exactly. I mean, the sky being rolled up like a scroll, there could be a reference again to the upheaval and the massive destruction and all those kinds of things. Uh, or it could be literal. Like God just goes, well, it's a wrap, you know, <laughs> whatever. And, uh, and that's that, uh, pun intended. But... Um, but these are things, again, we're talking about cataclysmic events that, by the grace of God, we're not going to be there to experience. We may see it from the balcony section, but we're not going to experience it uh, here on earth. And you can just praise God for that. But uh, it's predicted in Isaiah 34, verse 4, it says, And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts uh, shall fall down as the leaf falls off the vine, and it's a, falling, uh, it's a falling fig from the fig tree. And so it's going to be terrible. I'm just going to be glad not to be there. I mean, I, again, I, I don't know if I, I can adequately explain this, but uh, verses 15 and 16. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, uh, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. Uh, verse 16. And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, that's God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb, uh, that's our Lord Jesus. And so kings, great men, mighty men, every man, everyone, everyone that is left will try to hide from the Lamb. Bear in mind, uh, the believers have been caught away before all this. Uh, the people that become believers during this time period are martyred, and they're becoming fewer in number. And so who's left? The people that are shaking their fist at God. That to me is one of the biggest, I won't say miracle, but uh, amazing things that happens as we continue our trek through the rest of the book of Revelation is that God is pounding away and pounding away and they're going, no, I won't give. No, I, you know, and, and, and just being so stubborn and, uh, and, and, and taking their lumps along the way for it. And then where does it end? They end up being cast in the lake of fire. I mean, it, it, it's not a, a pretty end. But kings and great men, mighty men, everybody uh, is trying to hide from the Lamb. And this is, again, just as Jesus uh, predicted. In uh, Luke chapter 23, uh, verses 29 and 30, it says, For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs, the wombs that never bore, the breasts that never nursed. Um, then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. And uh, Isaiah describes a similar thing in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 19. And they should go into the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he rises to shake terribly the earth. When, when God arises, if you will, to do these things, people are going to scatter like cockroaches when you flip the lights on. You know, they're, they're trying to hide somewhere. And... Uh, it's an amazing kind of a parallel because, you know, back in Genesis chapter 3, God declared at one point, my spirit shall not always strive with man. I'm not going to put up with this, this baloney forever. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to argue with you forever. God has reasoned and reasoned and reasoned and warned and spoken all to be rejected. And obviously, it's, there, there comes a point where 
the jig is up, and here it is. But it's interesting that after the fall of man originally, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, remember they used to walk with God in the cool of the day, and uh, they were robed in light, the righteousness of God, I assume. And, uh, and when they ate of that fruit and they rejected the word of God, it says that they died. They didn't die physically, obviously. They died spiritually. And when they realized that they were dead spiritually but still alive physically, that's when they recognized, oh, we're naked. Then they heard God. What do they do? They hid, right? And when they finally came out, what did they do? They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, right? So they hid, and they covered themselves with some earthly thing. Now, Jesus is about to come back. The wrath of the Lamb is being poured out. What do they do? They hide, like in the rocks and the caves. I mean, the mountains fall on us. And they don't, want it. they don't want a covering from the blood of the Lamb. They want to be hidden from the Lamb. And so I see a parallel here. Um, again, at that point, all men suddenly find themselves as equals, all subject to the wrath of the Lamb. The psalmist asked the question, in Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Do you really think you can hide from God? Can you dig a hole deep enough? <laughs> can we cover ourselves in some way that God can't see us or find us? This is delusional in that sense. They still look to earthly coverings, rejecting the blood of the Lamb. Then finally now in verse 17, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Well, we know the answer to that question. Nobody can stand before the Lord. Nobody can resist these things. Looking back over the last, uh, the, the first of the six or first six of the seven seals uh, that have been opened and knowing what has taken place thus far, uh, the inhabitants of the earth summarize it and declare that the great and terrible day of God's wrath has arrived. And then again, no man can stand against it. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 76, verse 7, you yourself are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? The word wrath, you know, I, I, growing up, you know, in my house anyway, uh, I saw my dad get mad more than once. In fact, I think I helped him get that way. And, uh, you know, and, and I saw my mom, you know, get upset about stuff and be angry. Um, I knew what it was like to see and experience, in a certain sense, you know, the wrath of man. And, uh, but I never understood the word wrath until I read the Bible. I mean, I knew about being mad, I knew about being angry or frustrated, but I didn't ever actually come to a, an understanding of what wrath was until I began to read about the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is, is, a, is different than, quote-unquote, the wrath of man. Men are limited in what they can do, number one. But secondly, they're motivated by different things. You know, when I get angry, honestly, uh, when, I, when I lose it, and I sadly confess to you, I do. But when I lose it, it's usually because of my own selfishness. Something didn't go right the way I wanted it to go or, or, or perceived disrespect or being slighted or, or something, but it's usually ego related. Uh, it, it's usually, you know, convenience, like I'm working on a project. How many guys you work on a project and it just doesn't go right and you, you just rediscover old words that you stopped using a long time ago? <laughs> and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it's usually based on I deserve better. It's a, There's a selfish motive to it in some way, shape, or form. But God's wrath really is different. Because God's anger or his wrath is righteous and true. You know, there, there's a word, it's a big fancy word, I don't know how to explain it some other way, but the word is anthropomorphism. And an anthropomorphism is an attempt to describe a, a heavenly reality in earthly terms. How do you describe the infinite God? I mean, we talk, an anthropomorphism would be you know, the hand of God. But God's a spirit. Does he have hands? You know what I mean? And so when we, when we 
use a phrase like he's a jealous God, there's a connotation there of what God is like. Now, that's a human frailty being applied to God, but trying to somehow come to grips with what God is. And when we talk about the wrath of God, well, we know the wrath of man. But is God, you know, again, this is a human attempt to describe a heavenly thing. And so we, we see it, it. It looks really bad. I mean, earthquakes and fire and brimstone and, you know, all this stuff. That's not going to be the joy of God. So we're trying to describe something and obviously apply it to what we understand of God. But it, it, it is based on our own inability to do that. But So the wrath of God, as it's described, is always based on his righteousness. He is making something right that was wrong. Uh, he is making a correction that needs to happen. And so when, when we see the wrath of God being poured out, it's because he is righteous. It's because he is holy and, and true. Whereas the wrath of man is based on selfishness and, you know, those kinds of things. And so Paul describes this in Romans 1.18. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. There's a, a righteous motive behind it. And again, uh, it's not like we haven't been warned. I mean, we have been warned and warned and warned and warned so many times, so many different ways, who can possibly say, God, you know, why are you, why are you acting so rashly? Why are you acting so quickly? You know, it's been eons. He's been describing these things. Um, in, in Psalm 2, verse 10, Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. You know, two things here. Number one, when his wrath is kindled but a little, I'm reading these things kind of go, whoa, this is way over the top. But it's nothing compared to what God could do. He's got, he's, he's got more juice than we can handle. And, uh, and when his wrath is kindled but a little, but he says on the opposite end, that's what happens to those who reject him. But on the other side of this, he says, blessed are those who put their trust in him. I love this because we don't have to face the wrath. We're not made to face the wrath. Hell was, the lake of fire was designed for the angels that rebelled against him. And, and, and there's good news and bad news here. The good news is he's not mad at us. His wrath is not directed at us, his children. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus. We're not appointed to wrath. When the wrath of God is being poured out, guess what? We're pulled out and tucked away in a safe place under the shadow of his wings. And that's where you want to be, under the shadow of his wings. The rest of the world says, nah, bring it. You know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's essentially what they're saying. I can handle this. Oh, yeah? Wait and see. Yeah. People, we're going to party in hell. Uh, well, I don't think so. The bad news is he's just getting started. This is the halfway point. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And again, one of the, the, the most mind-boggling things to me is through all this, they're shaking their fists at him. And, and telling God to pound sand. And what a, what a terrible thing. Now, one of the questions I've, I've thought of at times is, Lord, why didn't you stop the book of Revelation after you revealed yourself? You know, chapter one. Okay, chapters two and three, the, the churches, the church age, I get it. Chapters four and five, the heavenly scene, awesome. And then the last verse in chapter five is the end. <laughs> You know, amen. Why do we continue from that point, chapter 6, through the rest of what we're going to go through? And again, I, I believe that part of this is to make us grateful for what we're going to miss. I mean, you ever, you ever made a left-hand turn in front of somebody and, and there was no accident? I did that a couple times, you know, being stupid, turned up in front of somebody, should have T-boned me. And I get through and I go, oh, Lord, thank you. 
I'm really grateful for what I missed. <laughs> Wasn't because I was so slick <laughs> or at all aware. It was the grace of God, and I missed that. And we're, we're dodging a, a big bullet here. So I'm very grateful for what I'm not going to. But I'm also, it compels me to want to share the gospel with people, to want to share the truth of Jesus with people, to want to somehow warn them of what they're headed into if they don't repent of their sins and turn to Jesus and, re and come to him on his terms. I just want to encourage you. One of the things that should come out of this study in general is an awe and wonder of what our God's going to do. To be grateful to miss it, but also to love other people enough to share with them. I mean, sit them down and read them through a couple chapters of you know, Revelation if they'll listen to it and go, this, by the way, is what's going to happen to you at any time now. <laughs> what? Yeah. If you don't know how to share the gospel, on our website, on the resource page, there's a couple of ways of how to share the gospel. If you want to share the gospel with somebody, you don't know how, come talk to me. I'll sit with you over a cup of coffee, and I'll, and I'll teach you how to, to share the gospel in a way that there's no argument. There's ways of doing that. But I think that we can't just take this and go, <laughs> God, I'm not going to do that. No. We've got to reach out to people so that they don't experience the wrath of God. Because it's, it's so much worse. I mean, these pages, I don't know if they do it justice of the reality, that it's gonna, the, the horror of what's going to happen. And if we believe it to be true, bless you. If we believe it to be true, then we should act on it. And if you need help with that, let me know. I'd love to help you. But ask God to give you the, the ability and the desire to talk to somebody, to share with them. Don't let this lesson just rattle around in your head in an academic sense, but let's look for how we can apply this in some way and help more people to get saved to, to avoid the things we're talking about. Amen? Amen? Father God, we thank you for your love and your kindness. We thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us friends, that you've spoken all the things that your Father has spoken to you, and you've given it to us, Lord. And now, Lord, you've put this treasure in our hands. Help us to be good stewards of it. Help us not to hide it and bury it somewhere, but, Lord, to, that you would bring forth the increase. And so we look to you. We thank you, Lord, that we're not appointed to wrath, but to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you for loving us that much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, let's just stand together and worship. Gracious Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, because in all honesty, Lord, our faith kind of goes up and down, but you're always steady and true. And we thank you, Lord, for paying the price for us. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you would sacrifice yourself to die that horrible death on the cross, that we might be with you forever. And we rejoice in you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. Lord, have your way in us. Help us, Lord, to be filled 
with your Holy Spirit and to do those things that are pleasing to you and help us to live a life, Lord, that is exemplary in the sense of brings glory to your name. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. His countenance, his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I hope and pray that our Lord continues to reveal himself to you. This is the book of Revelation. He is revealing himself. He's revealing his will. He's revealing his love and his grace and his mercy and so many things. I pray he continues to reveal himself to you and that he would be glorified in each of your lives today. God bless you guys. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We would love to pray with you. Have a good day.